The OSIA initiative is a partnership between government organizations and the identity industry that aims at building a global interoperability framework to connect all key building blocks of the identity management ecosystem. How? The OSIA community builds a set of open standards interfaces as a digital public good that ensure governments are able to select the building blocks they need from the suppliers they choose. As a result, OSIA unleashes market innovation, facilitates the implementation of multi-vendor programs and enables identity as a service. These are all the various building blocks available on the market necessary to build your ID management system. If these building blocks include OSIA interfaces, they can be easily connected, even if from different vendors, to form the identity management solution that fits your needs. Let's take an example. A government is issuing an identity card, physical and digital, to their citizens. To issue an ID card, citizens must first get enrolled. Let's follow the journey of four citizens living in different locations. Danielle Blue is enrolled by OSD. John Green by Copernic. Sam Orange by Orange. And Jack Red enrolled by Laxton. Thanks to OSIA interfaces, all these different enrollment systems can transfer without integration effort the collected data to the other building blocks for processing and storage. For privacy best practice, the demographic and biometric data are dispatched to two separate systems. The demographics data of John, Jack, Sam and Danielle is transferred to the Iron Group Population Register where a unique identity number is generated and the data is stored. The biometrics data of the citizens enrolled is transferred to the IDEMIA ABIS, where deduplication is performed and data is stored. If no problems are detected, the system is now ready to produce the identity card for the citizens. To do so, the enrollee's data is passed to the Interseed Credential Management System that manufactures and personalizes the ID card. At the same time, a digital version of the ID is created. Each citizen chooses his preferred digital ID wallet provider that proceeds to create a digital ID in the citizen's mobile phone. Danielle Blue by OSD, John Green by Gravity, Jack Red by Interseed and Sam Orange by Idemia. Now, John, Jack, Sam and Danielle are ready to use their trusted digital ID to access services online via their respective wallet. Interoperability benefits innovation and competition and can only be achieved with the contribution and engagement of the whole community. Join the OSIA initiative. Help us bring interoperability to life. So, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the next instalment of Science Media Partners Festival of Identity. So, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Mark Lockie. I'm the chairman of the event today, uh, which is entitled, OSIA Gets Real. It's time to unlock the identity ecosystem. So, we've had more than 300 people register uh, today, and I can see people joining from all sorts of exotic places. Um, I would say probably with much nicer weather than we have here in the UK, but that would be lying because we have uncharacteristically hot weather and I'm sitting here in a jacket and it's not comfortable. But nevertheless, uh, we have people from the French Riviera, we have people from Abuja, we have people from Switzerland, we have people from uh, Vancouver, um, all over the world. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know I can see that some of you have been here at the festival before, um, so welcome back. Uh, and for those of you that haven't been to our events before, um, 
we're obviously very happy to have you join us. Um, so, of course, it goes without saying that online events have provided a real lifeline to many of us over the last year and also uh, an important medium of exchange. But, and I very much hope uh, to be able to say this, and I'm very happy to say this, that we're going to be able to meet later this year at our live identity exhibitions and conferences um, organized by Terrapin uh, with Identity Week kicking off on the 22nd to 23rd of September, uh, followed by Connect ID, hot on its heels in Washington, DC on 5th to the 6th of October. So um, I'd like to say uh, thank you to all of my esteemed panelists. You can see them here at the bottom of my screen. Uh, they join us from the um, OSIA initiative, uh, which of course is what today is all about. Uh, and we also have representatives from the governments of Nigeria, and Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, and I'd also like to thank our event partners for this webinar, the Secure Identity Alliance. So before we kick things off, um, to those of you who don't uh, or aren't familiar with the system, I'd like to draw your attention to the, uh, to the panel on the side of your screen. Uh, there is, of course, a place for you to chat. And I'm very happy to see that lots of you are already doing that. So. Um, uh, carry on doing that. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great place to, to catch up with people if you haven't uh, been able to for a while. Um, however, if you do have a question, and you know we would like some questions along the way, I've got lots of questions to ask, but I'm sure you're going to be able to add to those. Please do go over to the questions tab uh, where we will be focusing um, our attention. Um, it's a democratic system. If you like someone else's question, click the upvote and that will start to raise that question to the top of the list. So what is the purpose of today's webinar? Well, I hope that you enjoyed the opening video, which really set the scene uh, for what OSIA is uh, and how it can be used. So I've been tracking its development for some years now, both as a journalist and as a conference organizer. And although there are definitely some headwinds, I can absolutely see that momentum is now building behind the initiative. And I don't see, say that sort of thing lightly. Um, I actually believe that this is going to be a game changer in terms of how civil identity systems are organized, how they're tendered, and ultimately how they're supplied. Um, so in organizing this webinar, we really wanted to get sort of under the hood, if you like, of the initiative to really understand where we are today, assess some of those challenges, celebrate the successes, and then look into the future. Uh, so how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to kick things off by talking with uh, Deborah uh, Komparin, who's the chair of the OSIA initiative. And she's going to bring us up to speed on um, how we've got to where we are today. Then we're going to invite our two government representatives to deliver uh, some short presentations on how they're implementing uh, OSIA-based initiatives in their countries. And then I'm going to ask them about their experiences. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, share with you a video compilation of five different suppliers. Uh, I had the pleasure to interview them over the last week or so to think what, uh, to see what their thoughts on uh, being part of the OSIA initiative are. Um, and it was very interesting. Uh, and then before we delve into any questions that you might have, we're going to bring Deborah back, uh, and I'm going to ask her a little bit about the future of OSIA. So not that busy, really. Quite a uh, you know an empty agenda. No, it's really packed, so we've really got to crack on. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to uh, start the first part of this webinar by inviting Deborah uh, Komparin, uh, chair of the OSIA initiative, to speak with us. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's. Let's say Deborah is reticent to take uh, credit, uh, but in truth, she has actually been on the OSIA initiative uh, since the start, and without her, OSIA would certainly not be where it is today. Uh, so, you know, congratulations to her. And Deborah, the timing of this webinar seems to be perfect, and I've got loads of questions for you. Um, but before uh, we get to those, I'm going to hand over to you for your presentation. Uh, so you can share with viewers where we are with OSIA and, um, you know, 
give us some of the key highlights of the initiative. So uh, welcome, Deborah. I'm just going to get your presentation up. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for the nice introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. Over to you, Deborah. So, um, as uh, hi everyone, first of all, and as Mark mentioned, I'm going to um, uh, give a short presentation on OSIA, and um, and then we'll leave some time for uh, for Q and A. Um, what OSIA is about? For those of you who have missed the initial video. OSIA is an initiative that aims at uh, bringing interoperability in the identity, uh, identity system market. And we do that by building uh, a set of open standard APIs, so a set of open standard interfaces as a digital public good. Uh, so in, in essence, uh, within OSIA, we have, we have modularized, if you will, uh, the identity market space. So we have identified what are the modules, the building blocks, that normally governments uh, purchase when they set up their identity management solution. And then we have built this set of open standard interfaces so to connect these various uh, modules, so to bring interoperability. Um, it's, it, this, this benefit of interoperability is not something new. Uh, so wh when we started this whole journey uh, in 2018, um, actually we looked at other uh, other sectors like uh, open banking or like telcos. So that where this approach to interoperability, thanks to open standard APIs, was uh, was already being uh, uh, implemented. So the benefits are very similar. Also, that we could the benefits that we could bring to the identity ecosystem, to the identity market. And so essentially, uh, first of all, it's about uh, um, leveling the playing field. So it's, it's trying to build a, a market where there is a level playing field competition, where everyone uh, can, can, uh, can be part, can, can be part with their technology, where their solutions can be part of the ecosystem and, can, uh, and are able to, uh, to, to, to market their products and to, to take part with the various solutions and implementation that exist around the world. But it's not only about leveling the playing field for current suppliers, current vendors, but it's also about opening the market to SMEs and local players. So to give them the possibility, the chance to uh, build uh, new services or, or just simply market their, their product and solutions and be part of this, uh, of this ecosystem. Then, um, as perhaps some of you know, uh, in the past, I would say, uh, five years, there's been some consolidation around the identity market, identity system market. And every time there is consolidation, uh, so there are merger and acquisitions, and, and it's quite a difficult time, not only for, for the companies involved, but also for the, for the customers or for the, for the governments that purchase the solutions from the companies that have uh, started this m &A, uh, process. And this is where an interoperability at market level, at industry level, could also help. And that's, that's a, I would say, the, the big reason of, uh, of interoperability, of bringing interoperability to the table. But the second reason, uh, not in order of importance, it's uh, addressing integrator and vendor locking. That's a concern uh, from, uh, from uh, customers, from governments that existed uh, since many years. This is nothing new under the sun. Uh, but it was really important to address this. Uh, and addressing this concretely means facilitating implementation of multi-vendor programs. That's, that's important. Multi-vendor doesn't just mean different vendors for different products. It could also be different vendors for the same product. So for instance, for a multi-vendor for enrollment. Um, it also, uh, the integrator and vendor lock-in, it's also associated by the fact that uh, product don't, they don't all have the same uh, life cycle. And so by not having the same life cycle, it means that I need, I, me as a customer, I need to be able to replace one part of this, this solution uh, with either an upgrade or either just simply uh, the same product from another vendor. And so this interoperability, this, this, um, this, this breaking up of the, the ecosystem and the market in modules that are all interoperable among different vendors facilitate this. And then finally, it's also about enabling identity as a service. So interoperability uh, helps with, uh, with um, uh, fraud detection. So by, by offering services of identity verification, and it also helps uh, the setup of a digital identity solution. But I'm not going to say more on this because there will be a presentation later from Nigeria exactly on, on this topic. 
So the way we understand interoperability within, within OSIA, it's about uh, consensus-driven uh, open standards. So we wanted to avoid, we, we knew there was a market change that had to happen, and we wanted to avoid having a, a de facto standard. So having a dominant player in the market that imposes itself with its solution, uh, with its implementation, and then uh, forces the, the, the shapes the way the market is seen uh, in order to all the rest of the players. So we wanted to really work together as an industry, as a community, together with our customers, with governments, uh, to shape ourselves the market and to define ourselves uh, based on consensus, the solution to interoperability. In a nutshell, so if I had to explain uh, very simply what OSI is all about, it's it allows governments, it allows customers to select building blocks, components, from the market, available in the market today, and easily connect them to build their solution to fit their use cases, to fit with their needs. Um, and the approach, and that's something that uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, very, I care very much about, is the fact that the, the approach we've taken to define all of this, all that I just said, uh, this interoperability approach, was not just uh, uh, some uh, within the industry, uh, so technical, really based on technical knowledge in, in a room working together, uh, but it's uh, a partnership between the identity industry and the governments. So it, this is very important that, uh, that this, uh, this concept, this approach to interoperability is shared. So it's shared not just by the vendors, but also by, uh, by governments. Uh, and this is who we are. Um, that's the community as a picture of a snapshot of the community as of today. So as you can see on the left part of the slide, uh, you see the, the vendors, so the, the identity industry, uh, part of the effort. And uh, what you see on the right is the governments that joined the initiative. Uh, this is a, um, a quick introduction on how we work together, uh, because as you can see, the community grew quite a lot in the past uh, past two years. Uh, so we have set up uh, our own structure to make sure that uh, uh, that that we um, uh, deliver uh, deliver on promise all the specifications we're building. Uh, so on one hand, we have the OSIA working group that was uh, split in sub working groups and we have uh, on a voluntary basis we have some uh, sub working group leader so basically there are some people from various uh, companies that volunteer to take on a subject and then they have their weekly calls that are open to everyone and they just uh, uh, move along with this particular subject then we meet once a month with the whole working group to make sure that we harmonize all the inputs and uh, and then we move forward together in a, as an, with, uh, based on the on the agenda we have then we have the OSI Advisory Committee, where governments sit, uh, government or international organization. Uh, this is the, let's say, the, the guiding part of the initiative. So that's that's where we have uh, the the roadmap that we should follow. We have uh, recommendations on the roadmap. We have recommendations on the specifications, on the vision of the market, what it's what needs to be improved, uh, what uh, what is good. And so it's sort of a feedback loop in between the technical side of the work and really the, the governments that are interested in, uh, in using this in the, in the various implementation. And finally, we have also um, uh, a technical, so uh, GitHub uh, community manager and also the technical authority that are in charge of harmonizing all the different uh, inputs before uh, uploading them to GitHub. The GitHub, that's where we share uh, all our specifications. So it's a public good. And so everything is publicly available. Um, I mentioned, I went straight to the solution saying what, what OSEA was about, explaining that, uh, that we see the interoperability via uh, the solution to interoperability via the setup, by the definition of open standard uh, interfaces. But what I didn't mention is that of course, we didn't know at the beginning that this was going to be the solution. And so we set ourselves some principles so that we said when the solution will, uh, will come, then we will be able to recognize that's the solution that we were looking for. And so the principles is what you see on the screen right now. So on one hand, it was about sovereignty of choice. So any solution to interoperability uh, didn't have to, we didn't want it to define a particular workflow uh, or a particular architecture of an identity management solution. Because we do think that every country is different uh, and every country should be sovereign of choosing the system, the implementation that fit with their needs. 
The second principles was about uh, uh, technology neutrality, in the sense that it's very important for us to maintain the competition, the competition among vendors that also is fostering innovation. And so we thought that the various building blocks, the various modules would be treated as black boxes. So we didn't want to look at what's, in, what's inside. This is where you come, this is where you compete. And so this is where the idea of APIs really fit uh, with the, with this principle. So we only work at the, at the top layer level, so on the API's interface level to bring interoperability and not on the, on the single module. And finally, uh, privacy by design. And here I have to mention that uh, we have the help of, uh, of academia to do this. So to make sure that um, uh, we don't forget best practices, uh, even if we operate at interface uh, layer and interface level, we want to make sure that uh, we consider all best practices around privacy by design. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on how OSIA works. I'm just going to say that um, you can have a look at our GitHub page and the, our specification. But um, I want it to be a bit more specific uh, and, and let's say less theoretical maybe. So just to let you know that OSIA is, you can think of it as, as divided into two parts. So there is the foundational part of the system, that's where we, really OSIA was born, uh, to bring interoperability in the foundational modules. And we show in a minute what it is all about. And then there is the identity usage or the sectoral view, which is uh, about bringing interoperability um, for, uh, for identity usage. So how do you facilitate, for example, uh, the verification uh, from banks uh, or, or uh, telecom operators of of the validity of a document or or the or some claims uh, from uh, potential customers and so each one of these uh, separate sections you could open them like a box and you could see the different building blocks that we have identified that normally governments purchase to set up a solution this is the modularization part so if i were to open this part of the box then you would see some of the modules that uh, that we have identified as part of osia and what you see in pink here is the interfaces. So that's once we identified what's, what are the modules without describing the technology, then we imagine some use cases and we come up with all the interfaces that you would need uh, in any combination of these modules to fulfill your use case. So we've seen a video earlier, we're going to see a video uh, at the end of the webinar and you can see two totally different use cases, two totally different, uh, very different vendors part of, with different products part of the use case, uh, all with, the, it, it, all with um, various modules uh, that they have and uh, that are connected thanks to all the interfaces. And so you really see that we are not here to push any particular architecture or any particular technology, but really just to bring interoperability at the interface level. And if the same, if you were to open this box, uh, which I'm going to, to skip, and then uh, you can, again, you can have a look at the detail of the, of the interfaces in our GitHub page. Um, and this slide is to say that uh, maybe uh, it's, when I say interfaces, uh, maybe you, you don't grasp how, how much uh, work actually there's behind, because these interfaces have to make sure that by any combination of these modules, you comply with any use case. And so actually it's a long list of services, which we have categorized. And this same categorization that you see here in the slide, you can find it in GitHub. So you can go and you can open each and every single one of these interfaces and these uh, services, and you can actually access the specification for it. Uh, like I mentioned, this is uh, where we store our all our work. It's publicly available. It's in our GitHub page. So here are the links. But if you go in the OSIA website, you can also find the link to our GitHub page. And um, of course, there are uh, you can uh, reference these in tenders. Uh, it's explained in the in the specifications in the document how you could do that it's very simple it's by uh, interface name and the version so every interface has a defined version and so this is for for my introduction um, and really my main message is that for us to be successful so to bring this openness 
in the market, uh, it's very important that we work together. So if we if we don't have a strong community behind, and community means uh, um, private sector, but also um, governments, uh, we will not reach the, the 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 target we set to reach. So it's very important, like we have done in the past two years, uh, that that we all work together and we all collaborate. So this is really a call to join the initiative. Maybe we can get into the details later if you're interested on how to join. But uh, but this is something that is uh, is we welcome everyone and everyone is open is is welcome to actually come and join and contribute. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Deborah. That's that's really good. Um, can I ask you to turn your your video on? Oh, I think she's lost. Uh, I I have the video on. Ah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Don't know why it's not showing up on my screen. Anyway, there we go. There you are. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Deborah, it's really great to see how this initiative has developed. Um, and so, if it's okay, I'd like to um, fire it fire away a few questions to you, if that's okay. Yep. Go ahead. Cool. So. Um, just to explain uh, to the audience, you know, what we don't want is for this webinar just to be, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, we <laughs> want this to be putting Deborah and the team here, you know, under the microscope. So, you know, I can see some really good questions already coming in. Um, and Tunji's already started answering some of those questions. So um, please uh, carry that that forward. But uh, my questions are going to be um, are going to be tough, Deborah. So um, you've been doing this for two and a half years. Uh, since the beginning, as we've described. Um, I want to know what was the driver behind the initiative, you know, right from the start? Because some cynics, um, and there are a lot of cynics in the world, might say that it was the threat uh, or the perceived threat of um, open source technology uh, to the mainstream identity industry uh, that sparked its creation. Uh, but, I, you know, I've spoken with you and, and others over the past few weeks and I've tracked, as I say, its development um, over the last few years. And, you know, I think Ostia perhaps went back further than that. Um, so you've been there since the beginning. So come on, tell us how did it all start and why did it start? Um, as, as part of my job, uh, I actually always uh, talk with uh, with governments, with customers. And um, uh, although I was quite new to the identity industry because I joined uh, four years ago, um, there was a common theme among all these different customers, the, the, the various governments, and it's this frustration with this lack of interoperability. So like some of the examples I mentioned, the ability of uh, avoiding the wall-to-wall -wall solution and being able to replace some modules, so the different life cycle of the various products, etc. So uh, it, it really came from the market. So uh, to me, it, it was very clear that there was a, a need there or a frustration. And so the first thing that uh, that I've done is uh, to confront with uh, some colleagues from, from other companies. And actually the frustration was there, the need was there, it was very clear. And so I think it was really a push from the market on in doing making this change. Then of course it was crystallized by uh, the ID for Africa survey in to ta back in 2018 uh, to over 300 uh, gov um, governmental agencies uh, that asked, among other questions, what frustrates you about uh, implementation of identity management system? What would you like to see changing? And the answer was uh, vendor locking and the lack of interoperability. And it was a nice timing because in 2018 we were already working on on OSIA, and so we actually did a soft launch of uh, of the initiative at that time. And uh, this this survey that uh, uh, really I think uh, helped us to to just move very quickly to the next level, because uh, one thing is to it's having your opinion and hearing that this is a need. Another thing is to have concretely in front of you uh, a result of a survey to, made throughout Africa saying. Uh, this has to change. Okay. Okay. Good answer. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I wanted to pass again my congratulations on to you and the Ossia community. Um, you know, because it's a real community. Uh, you you've started to get momentum um, as we've seen on the news recently with numerous projects that have um, have got off the ground. However, I'm sure it's not all been plain sailing. Um, you know, what have been some of the challenges that you've seen along the way? Um, and what are you particularly proud of? 
Uh, so maybe Mark, let's let's start with the challenges. Um, the, the the first one that comes to mind is of course the technical challenge. So um, it's it's about really uh, working together with with various uh, competitors and the different vendors and in coming up with an understanding of the various modules that are needed. So really modularize the space and also defining. Uh, uh, accepted uh, with based on consensus a set of uh, um, of open standard interfaces so I, I maybe i don't thank them enough but but really the the heart and soul of the initiative is all this uh, the technical people that put a lot of effort uh, an incredible effort in in uh, building the specifications in uh, i would say in a quite a short amount of time because it didn't take a decade to build but actually a, a couple of years so th this technical tech that this is uh, the say the uh, a challenge so the technical side of uh, of osia on the other end it was um uh credibility uh, so uh, I'm being really blunt here so w when we launched osia um, we had the sort of polarized uh, reaction to it so on one hand we had some uh, companies that some vendors that were uh, really enthusiastic about it and they immediately joined some other that say hang on a minute let's let, let's let me sit and wait because um, there is, was this fear that big vendors were using this tool to actually further lock and control the market. And so we had to, um, it took time, it took time and, uh, and we had to work uh, on, on this uh, credibility aspect. And this is true not only within the identity sector, but also with international organizations, because uh, when you say we're building a digital public good, uh, actually as, as a set of uh, vendors and governments, well, vendors is linked with profitability. And so it's not necessarily always associated with something good or something made for the public good. And actually, we had to explain that uh, vendors and, and industry has been behind many technical standards in the, in the past uh, decade. So this is nothing different. OK. And but this is for the challenges. But you, if you talk yeah, about something the good. Second, uh, the, second, the second part is, you know, what are you most proud of, Deborah? Come on. Um, you know, I'm, I, I think you must have a whole load of things that you're proud of. Yes. So um, it's an easy one, this one. So by far, uh, the community. So this is what I'm most proud of. Uh, so it's the fact that we managed to uh, to to pull together competitors and having competitors competitors setting aside uh, their their, uh, their 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 agenda to actually work together on a common objective. That it's this understanding that there is a greater good a greater gain if you will by by actually working together even if uh, after in the field we, we are all competitors still and we have different products different vision different technologies so by, by far is this and then of course the fact that uh, it's not just a blah blah like you said earlier so it's it's not just uh, right. <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> marketing but it's a uh, uh, it's actually we moved from uh, specifications to also we are seeing some uh, some implementations in the field. So all is getting concrete, and that's that's uh, that's something important. Yeah, I think that's a you know it's a it's a journey uh, you know which maybe to you feels like the end of the journey to get these implementations out, but I'm sure it's just the start of the journey really. Yes, uh, it is. <laughs> Uh, Deborah, I'd like to go back to the question, and it's coming up in some of the questions here now. Um, the question of open source, and I think it's a bit un misunderstood, um, and I can see there's possibly misunderstood questions here. Um, it's a question that always comes up. Yes. Um, isn't isn't the open source approach competing with OSIA, or is there maybe a role for open source solutions? Within the OSIA framework, uh, maybe, maybe this perception of uh, the competition is is a, is a red herring. Uh, maybe maybe they're actually complementary technologies. So here's your moment. Give us those thoughts on open source technology. Actually, open source technology are welcome to to take part and to join the OSIA community, as all the rest of the vendors are welcome. So um, I, I think 
open source is for sure competing with the various vendors as we are all competing uh, with, with our products. But OSIA, I would say, is, is, a, is a different layer. It's a layer on top to make sure that if we all stick to this vision of this module in the market and we are all compliant to open standard interfaces, then we can all be interoperable. And, and any solution, any implementation could be a mix, right? It could be a mix of proprietary, open source, or even just open source, and then you will be able to swap one component in the future for another. So the point is really, let's try to work together in spite of the technology or a particular implementation. Because as I said earlier, for OSIA, the modules, the building blocks are black boxes. So we are not looking inside. And if you if you have an open source offer, then so be it. Um, so our point is, is to work together for the benefit of, uh, of everyone, really, including governments, and, and in building this uh, interoperability. Right, OK. Thank you. Um, that's 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 great. Um, so, Deborah. So, final question for now. Um, yeah. Perhaps not even a question. Um, as you're aware, we've now got, uh, and perhaps I could ask um, uh, Mr. Musa and um, and and uh, Mr. Doradala to uh, turn on their videos and uh, and unmute. Um, but you're, as you're aware, we've got um, you know they're two of the leading African nations in terms of identity implementations. Uh, and in a moment, we're going to hear from them about their uh, Aussie experiences. Um, do you perhaps have a nice message uh, for them before before I actually go, go ahead and introduce them? Well, actually, they are uh, two of our greatest supporters. So they've been there since the very beginning. Um, so we have many nice memories together when actually OSIA was still uh, an idea on, on paper. Uh, so of course, uh, I, would, I would never thank them enough for their support because without their support, we wouldn't be where we are today. Uh, I. I appreciated the, the way they've approached OSIA from the beginning in a, in a very collaborative way, uh, which is not a given. And um, and I think I don't want to add more things to what they're going to present, but to me, both these presentations are an example of uh, how OSI, of the value that OSIA can bring to the to the market in a different way. Because on the case of uh, of DRC, we have we have seen that thanks to OSIA, they have implemented a multi-vendor program. And in Nigeria, we've seen a local company being able to offer services on top of identity, uh, in spite not being uh, the main uh, supplier of the identity management system in the country. And that's again, thanks to this interoperability. But I will leave it to them uh, to, to give, go down to the details. That's brilliant. So um, at least on my screen, and I assume it's the same on yours, Deborah, um, we appear to have lost uh, our Nigeria uh, government representative. <laughs> um, Tunji, are you are you there? I don't so think he is. So, connectivity problems. Uh, I'm hoping um, hoping he'll be able to join us in a moment. So um, what that means is, um, I'd like to start off the um, the next part of this with um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, so um, I would like to invite um, Musavuli um, Buto Musa uh, to give his presentation into the use of OSIA. Um, in your country. Uh, sorry, I, I know that we were going with Nigeria first, but, uh, you know, technical problems and, and all of that. So um, thank you so much for joining us, um, um, Musa. I'm going to um, bring up your presentation, um, if you just bear with me. Um, and um, if it's okay, I'll, I'll just hand straight over to you. Okay. I thank the organizers of this uh, Festival of Identity webinar uh, presented in uh, association with the Secure Identity uh, Alliance. It's a pleasure and uh, honor to share a short recap of OSIA's history in DSC, some successes and uh, some challenges. My special thanks go to Mark Lucky, chairman of the event, and Deborah, as well as to Dr. Joseph Attic, the ID for Africa chairman, who continues to be a source of inspiration for issues related to identity in Africa. Since 2019, 
President Felix Antoine Tshisekedi Chilombo of the Democratic Republic of Congo has been showing new leadership determined to make digital a thing for good governance and the fight against corruption. This vision was shared through a broad national consensus that resulted in the national digital plan. The president expressed the ambition to give each Congolese citizen during his term of office access to a trusted legal and digital identity and ultimately to offer modern identity management services. As elsewhere in the world, the government of the DRC, led by His Excellency Sama Lukonde, aims to modernize the national identification system by taking into account the national digital plan. In the government program reported by Parliament, the Axis 42 establishes the commitment to implement the government's national plan and the objective 32 of Axis 5 establishes the commitment to carry out the census as well as the identification of the population. This charge will be overseen by the new Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of the Interior Security, Decentralization and Customer Customary Affairs. The National Office for Population Identification has already started implementing OSIA interfaces. But there is still a need to strengthen the capacity of ONIP experts. The first phase of this project is a feasibility study, the launch of which required the prior establishment of the National Monitoring Committee for the implementation of SNEED in DRC and the recruitment of a firm to conduct said study. The decree establishing this National Monitoring Committee was signed on March of the last year, and the EY cabinet was selected following an international call for tenders launched in the wake of the AFD, which saw more than 40 expressions of interest. The new Minister of Digital, His Excellency Eberan Kolongele, has the heavy responsibility of materializing the vision of digital development in DRC, which His Excellency, the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, had promoted through the National Digital Plan. This task is certainly complex. However, the cohesion of the government in the implementation of the National Digital Plan the subject being transversal and the involvement of all stakeholders in the process can guarantee the success. Having shared the concerns raised by the Secure Identity Alliance at the 2019 I, I for Africa meeting in Johannesburg, the DLC committed to participate in the discussions which resulted in the official launch of the OSIA initiative. Two major principles caught our attention in addition to sovereignty of the choices and technology neutrality. The first principle which retained our attention is the lack of common definition as to the overall scope of an identity ecosystem and in the main functionalities of a system's components and also standards interfaces that enables communication with each component and make it easy to swap out components or add new ones to the system. Indeed, the target 16.9 of the UN Sustainable Development Goals is to provide legal identity for all, including birth registration, 
by the year 2030. But there is a major barrier, the lack of vendor, provider, and technology neutrality, commonly known as vendor locking. For the government policy makers, that's the way implementing, implementing national identification system, vendor locking is now one of the, the biggest concerns. In DRC, we agree on standards-based connect, connectivity layer between all key components within the national identity ecosystem. The process in DRC takes place in five stages. The first one is the negotiations. The presidency and the Ministry of the Interior have been sensitized since 2019. With the change of government, we must obtain the commitment of the new Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Interior and the Minister of Digital. Secondly, is granting. With the change of the government, it's important that the Deputy Prime Minister identify the, actor, the actors of the OSIA process and give his orientations. Unfortunately, the urgency of pacifying the provinces of Ituri and North Kivu, as well as the disaster caused by the eruption of the volcano, have rekindled the momentum. The third stage is the provision. The provision of resources to actors who raise awareness among stakeholders and especially beneficiaries lock vendors and startups. The fourth step is the managing. It's important that Congolese decision makers manage the set of the limits, define priorities, define commitment, and ensure alignment. And lastly, for reporting, for our part, we will always be ready to participate in the discussion, training, especially to report to Congolese institution and the OSIA advisory committee. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Musa. It's a really interesting presentation. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's actually answered quite a lot of the questions that I had, uh, you know, prepared to ask you. So, uh, so that's good. Um, but, you know, can you, you know, just from a personal level, say, you know, what was it that really attracted you to the Otia um, concept, and why was it really important, in your opinion? Thanks. As I said, uh, it's very clear that the sovereignty of the choice and the technology neutrality catched my attention during the ID for Africa meeting. Yeah. When we discussed on the question in uh, Abuja uh, ID for Africa meeting. Uh, but uh, there is uh, a lot of work uh, we understood we, we had to, to, to develop. And we, we think, we, we thought it was important to concentrate on the two principles I just mentioned, the lack of common definition. Uh, you know, uh, there is too much, too, too many actors in DRC who are involved in the, the identity uh, ecosystems, but we have a, a very big problem of the lack of common definition of, you know, the building blocks uh, everybody is manipulating. And there is also the need to standardize the interfaces. You know, we have now uh, actually uh, too many startups who would like to join this uh, ecosystem, but without uh, uh, standardized interfaces, uh, they can uh, face uh, many difficulties. So now, that they, so now that those um, uh, startup, for example, uh, 
have a set of um, open API standards to work towards. That means that does that give them sort of more opportunity to get involved with programs that you're putting together then? At the end of the day, uh, they should be trained. We, we have we've started to to share all these details in, for example, uh, a new uh, commerce chamber of digitalization and uh, telecom. We've shared this uh, 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 progress of of the, the APS developed by by OSIA initiatives. We shared also with uh, members of the, the members of the Minister of Digital, but there is still the need of uh, structured trainings. So uh, we think, uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Digital, OSIA uh, should uh, uh, organize some trainings for startups and other local uh, vendors who are involved in this process. I see. Tell me a little bit about what it's like to be part of the OSIA community Has it, and, and, and implementing OSIA. Has it actually been a really positive experience for you? Can you repeat the question? So, um, what's it been like to actually be part of the whole OSIA community you know, and, and implement OSIA? Has it actually been a very positive experience for you? Yeah, but um, it's very difficult for me to to give a, a good answer, I would like, for example, uh, for the uh, one of the experts of uh, the ONIP, you know, our, our uh, institution in charge of identifying people, to give some comments on uh, the way we, we, we are trying to, to build the, the OSIA community in DRC, because they have already started implementing the, the, the OSIA uh, interfaces. Uh, it's, it's, it's it's difficult for me to give uh, too much comment at this stage. Uh, uh, I would like them to to make this comment if they... they yeah, well, it's still early days, isn't it? Um, it's still early days. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, what do you see? I mean, do you have uh, some thoughts then on uh, DRC and identity projects in the future, um, you know, do you think that they would also want to be using this uh, OSIA initiative and the standards? Yes, yes, yes. You know, uh, we, the, the new Minister of Digital and the new Minister uh, in charge of the interior uh, are being sensitized to the, the process uh, launched by OSIA initiatives and they already expressed the interest to uh, to be involved also in that process but we are we are still trying to to firmly uh, bring the institution to to officialize uh, to more officialize the the, the position of DRC and the way of implementing implement, implementing the the APIs, the neutral APIs, and the coming uh, system which is being developed. Okay. So finally, if I if I may, um, just I, I know that there are. I can see from the uh, from the list of people attending that there are other countries out there that could well be interested in. Uh, taking their own uh, journey using the OSIA, uh, you know, interfaces. Um, do you have any any advice for them? Any words of encouragement or anything like that? Yeah, I will encourage them to 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 get in contact with three institutions. You know, the Minister of Interior. Uh, who is leading the, the ONIP uh, mission and also the ministry in charge of digital because the future of identity ecosystem development in DSC will be uh, led by these two institutions. So if some uh, actors uh, vendors or experts would like to 
to be involved in, involved in the, the OZIA process in DRC, it's better for them to join to contact the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Digital. Okay, yes, it's very so important to get buy-in for these uh you know, for these types of um, projects and initiatives. So thank you so much, Musa, for, for joining us and for stepping in there. Uh, I can see, hopefully, that we have Tunji back uh, with us. Um, so I'm going to um, very quickly introduce him before we, we, before we lose him again. Um, <laughs> uh, that's, that's technology for you, isn't it? Um, uh, so le let me just introduce you. Um, uh, so we have, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ola Tunji um, Duradola. Um, who's the Chief Innovation Officer at Common Identity. Uh, um, Common Identity is a, uh, a company um, that has implemented this uh, very innovative uh, project you're about to listen to uh, from Nigeria, um, uh, you know, in association with, um, uh, with NIMSI, uh, the, uh, the, the, com the commission there in, uh, in Nigeria. Um, so we're honoured to have you here, Tanji, and uh, very pleased. So I'm going to just hand straight over to you before we have any more mishap. But uh, let me just bring your your presentation up onto the screen. Uh, just a second. So thank you for joining us, Tanji, and uh, I'll hand over to you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening wherever you are in the world. And thank you for joining us. So my name is uh, Tunji Jurodola. I am the, uh, the uh, as he, um, Mark rightly put it, the Chief Innovation Officer, as I like to uh, put it, of Common Identity Limited, which is uh, a small Nigerian uh, startup that is involved in uh, digitization of uh, the, the ecosystem in Nigeria. Now, the um, National Identity Management Commission is the agency in Nigeria that is responsible and charged with uh, identity management in the country and serves as the custodian of the National Identity Database. It is uh, the agency that issues um, a government-wide uh, uh, 11 digit national identification number, which is uh, backed by an Act of Parliament um, of uh, 2007 in Nigeria and it is mandatory by law for anyone who is a, a citizen of Nigeria or a legal resident to uh, have a national identification number. It is illegal to have more than one, and that number stays with you from, uh, from birth until, uh, until the, uh, it is retired when the person dies. Now, the agency is currently being supervised by the Ministry of Communications and Digital Economy, uh, whose head is um, uh, the Honorable Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, Dr. Issa uh, Ali Pan uh, Pantami. And the Director General of uh, NIMSI also happens to be the uh, Chair of the Advisory Board of OSIA and, and the person of Engineer Aliu Aziz who regrettably couldn't uh, attend today because of some other uh, pressing government matters. So um, I'm here to make this uh, brief uh, presentation to, to the House to um, uh, explain exactly what it is that we are trying to do. I'll try, try and uh, you know, collapse it into about uh, eight, eight or nine minutes. So um, w when the OSHA initiative started off back in uh, uh, about two and a half years ago, we had already started to lay down the framework of digitizing uh, the, uh, the ecosystem uh, uh, for, for Nigeria. Um, before now, Nigeria, uh, the NIMSI had been seen as uh, the National ID Card Commission, which it is not. In other words, everybody had seen it as being the agency responsible for issuing national identity cards. Now, um, Unfortunately, due to so many issues, uh, so many vendors, there were probably about 27 vendors responsible for the infrastructure, the national identity management system infrastructure in Nigeria. And it had become very, very expensive to manage. Uh, you have so many foreign vendors that kept coming with uh, yearly, monthly uh, 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 bills, which the federal government couldn't uh, maintain because of so many other uh, pressing issues. 
And then the decision was then uh, taken to redefine how we um, issue out credentials to Nigerians, try to overhaul to take uh, into consideration the fact that there are so many silos in different uh, organizations, government agencies, and so on. They will have your bank verification number issued by the private sector, by the banking community. You have your driving license number. You have your tax ID number. So many uh, tokens that were out there. And you'd have different people uh, or a person with different identities. So the, I, the, the decision was then taken to then make sure that there was a single ver uh, uh, version of truth. In other words, no matter where that person's information resided, you had to be sure that it was the same person. At the same time, we needed to enhance uh, privacy and personal identity to make sure that um, one's information was not abused. Uh, with taking a leaf and learn so many lessons from stories that we'd heard in India and other countries uh, by attending so many of these ID for Africa conferences right from the, from the get-go. And we were fortunate uh, in Nigeria to have hosted it about uh, two, or two or three years ago. So based on that, the Honorable Minister was able to see a vision that uh, we could actually redefine how identity is managed in Nigeria and digitize what we had to make sure that uh, people got what they expect out of this uh, infrastructure. So we now found that, look, the best way to make sure that the various components that make up the national identity management system in Nigeria is also overhauled so that a lot of these proprietary interfaces that we had with uh, ABIS, with uh, card, uh, the card, uh, card bureau, with uh, um, uh, verification services, and so on, that and enrollment, that all of them uh, um, evolve to use an interface or a suite of interfaces that can talk to each other. So they don't have one monolith, and you, but you can break it down into various modules, and each one should be able to talk to each other, which is where the OCR uh, initiative became very attractive to Nigeria. So what Nigeria has done now is that it has now come up with a suite of services, which um, one of which is called the mobile web service or MWS. Um, and um, so what we have is that the federal government in Nigeria has now issued these tokens and redefined the various uh, 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 tokens that are issued to Nigerians. In the past, we had a very long uh, a big uh, piece of paper that was being issued uh, as uh, the na uh, national identification number slip uh, so we, we, that has now been redefined to make sure that rather than use security paper we are now able to use uh, plain paper but making sure that we integrate things uh, into that plain paper that adopts uh, certain standards that even Akao itself has put out there things like um, visible digital seals for non-electronic documents. So we're taking a, a, a cue from many uh, interfaces and many solutions and standards that have been out there to make sure that Nigerians can get what we call self-sovereign identity, put the identity back in the hands of, of Nigerians and make sure that they know who is doing what and where and, and when. So these are some of the things that we have uh, put together. Now. What, uh, one of the things that we are also trying to do is to go uh, a step further beyond just uh, digitization of the national identification number and personal data, also to include uh, tokenization. Because what we want to avoid is a scenario whereby people's information is, um, is uh, proliferated or is abused or is stored in databases whereby ordinarily they're supposed to go back to the central authority, which is NIPC, to make sure that they verify someone's credentials each time it is presented. But we found that in a lot of instances, a lot of these organizations were storing this information without any control or oversight whatsoever. NIMC, for example, goes through annual audits by the BSI and also by uh, 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 another body called the GVCP, which is now transforming into PCI DSS. And so he has to make sure that it conforms to a lot of very strict and stringent 
um, uh, audits to make sure that people's data are stored securely. But where you have a lot of other uh, enterprises or uh, entities that are doing verification services, but then are not uh, rendering account as to how uh, people's identity are being verified, uh, all of that is now being overhauled to make sure that wherever somebody's credentials are being presented, it must be verified on the fly. And we also try to make sure that um, uh, someone's national identification number may only need to be used once, and that is during onboarding of one of these uh, 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 new credentials. Therein after, uh, when someone or an entity needs to do any verification, then it is done in such a way that uh, uh, the, the token itself, even if that entity stores it, uh, there's a life cycle to it. And the owner of the ID will always have a record of whoever did that uh, verification. So these are some of the things we're trying to put together. And we're also trying to make sure that using these OCR interfaces, we should be able to connect to practically any other uh, component, whether it is the APIS, whether it is enrollment, whether it is a credential management system, whether it is um, uh, verification services, all of these need to be uh, 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 administered by uh, OCR interfaces for uh, interoperability and, uh, and, and ease of use. That way, one will not have to, because Nigeria has been burned, as I'm sure many other African countries have as well, in the past by a lot of bad actors who came up with proprietary solutions. And when the government was not able to maintain uh, support and maintenance and uh, all those uh, other bills, associated uh, uh, bills, then they just cut them off and then the, the government is, is in a mess. But that is no longer going to, to, to happen. Now, the roadmap of what we have um, is uh, very simple. Um, the, um, the mobile IT, which uh, was launched on, by the Honorable Minister last December, was the first step in the digitization of this process. To date, we now have uh, about a little under 10 million uh, persons who have the, uh, the mobile ID on their smartphones, whether it is Android or, um, or iPhone. Um, and every two or three weeks, new updates keep coming out, security patches to make sure that we re remain at the cutting edge of um, secu security implementations to reduce vulnerabilities and the like. We are also try to um, uh, make sure that in 2021, we uh, further uh, improve the security of these documents by implementing uh, biometric authentication and, and the like. And tokenization itself will uh, likely take place sometime uh, in, in July uh, to be launched by the Honorable Minister. The whole idea, as I wrap up, is to make sure that we have one identity in Nigeria. Uh, gone are the days of proprietary solutions, gone are the days of somebody having multiple identities, uh, and, and also because of some of the security challenges that we have had about people hiding uh, behind uh, 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 various identities. We're trying to clean all of that up and also the one of the main things that uh, Deborah pointed out earlier on is m making sure that whatever we're putting together is, uh, is is driven by privacy by design and privacy by default. So that is a summary of uh, my discussions uh, so far. Uh, there's a lot more that we can discuss about it if one wanted to go into details. But generally, the federal government of Nigeria is very happy to, uh, and very keen and passionate about making sure that um, these new tokens uh, permeate into the lives of Nigerians and Nigerians should have back uh, control of their own personal identity. The uh, president of Nigeria launched these tokens on the 6th of May uh, this year, and um, we are now moving forward at a very uh, uh, strong pace to make sure that uh, the, these systems are uh, readily implemented with strong documentation uh, and, uh, and support where necessary. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Tanji. That's um, a really clear and very um, informative uh, overview of, of, of the experience that you've had. Um, so have I just lost Tanji again? <laughs> this is uh, uh, 
one of the problems. I think his uh, his computer system is uh, is giving him the uh, the, the runaround. Um, so I did have some questions for him, but uh, when he uh, manages to get back on, we'll we'll probably ah he's back. So <laughs> okay, well we in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions if that's okay. Please shoot. Um, Go ahead. Um, and you know you've been really clear about what um, what this is uh, has been like and why Nigeria government is so um, in support of um, implementing an OSIA style um, uh, set of modules and, and interface. But let's look at it from a slightly more personal perspective. Um, you know, as you said, you're a smaller domestic player, uh, common identity, and you're playing in a field of a lot of larger um, or even mid-sized identity solutions providers. So, what sort of advantages has OSIA given to a company, um, or you know, a company like yourself? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Now, um, one of the things that Nigeria is trying to do, especially uh, uh, various uh, ministers with the, the, the president himself, is to make sure that um, uh, homegrown talent is given uh, the first advantage to come up with solutions uh, that will meet or exceed uh, international standards, um, whereby uh, the whole idea is to make sure that whatever it is you are, you are trying to introduce into the ecosystem is something that uh, uh, will, can uh, meet international uh, best practices and standards. And we found that the easiest way to be able to do, uh, to accomplish that would be to use open standards. Um, I, I understand that there, there has been a bit of confusion um, in the past between open standards and open source. And I think uh, Deborah tried to, to clarify it in that open source only serves as uh, another vendor. Um, and I've always been a proponent of open source for many, many years. I haven't used a, a, a Microsoft product since uh, Windows XP came out in 2001. Careful, uh, you're gonna get cut off again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, 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 uh, but I mean, there are a lot of very rich solutions that are out there, uh, which, uh, and open source has really matured over the years, but open standards is really the way, the, 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 the way forward. So there is a big difference between open standards and uh, open source. So we found that with OCR, because of the sheer wealth of the uh, players that are there, those are, are the big weeks that you mentioned earlier on, and mid-sized players, and even smaller ones, because we're not the only small company that is there. There are other companies like Gravity and so on that are also doing remarkable things uh, elsewhere in, in the world. Um, so what we're trying to do is to make sure that uh, there is a level playing field uh, for, for everyone. Just come up with their own solutions, make sure that, uh, because even with the, some of those play, players are actually involved in the Nigeria system. And we have advised them that uh, whatever they have deployed in Nigeria in the past, they need to update and upgrade to make sure that they now expose OCR-based interfaces to interconnect with each other. That's uh, uh, the, the mantra. So yes, uh, OCR has been uh, very, very instrumental to our success. And, uh, and we, we are finding that quite a number of other smaller players as well are also trying to adopt a lot of these OCI interfaces so that when they come up with their own brilliant ideas, they, they can easily interconnect into the ever-growing uh, Nigerian ecosystem. Brilliant answer, Tunji. And, and you can see from the questions that we've got at the moment that, um, you know, there are definite misconceptions or, or questions, uh, quite rightly, you know, why not, about, you know, OSIA, MOSIP, open source, you know, an open platform. It's it's so important to understand that difference between open platform and open source. And I think you just described that really well. But I will ask Deborah to do it again, because it just seems to be something Absolutely. that people just have to Absolutely. get into their head as to what as to what this is all about. Um, what about other, other countries um, wanting to embark on the OSIA journey? And I mean, I, I assume you can see this replicating across uh, the African continent. And, and of course, it's not just an African initiative. This is, you know, interoperability, um, you know, and open standards is, 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 is a, you know, it's a global issue, surely. Yes, so interesting, very inter uh, interestingly, uh, let me see, five countries in the past three months have approached us to say that they are very much interested in um, 
um, implementing or starting to dis have a, a meaningful discussion about uh, implementing digitization of their own um, their own um, uh, citizenry and their own uh, national databases based on what they have seen that Nigeria has done or is doing at the moment. And it's very encouraging in that, uh, you know, I make a lot of presentations around the world. And th this project is something that I have uh, been to the four corners of the planet talking about over the past four years. It's not something that came out, out, out of the blue. So uh, online, there are so, so, so many um, uh, uh, places that I've gone to, even including SDW that you are very much involved in um, in, in the past. And um, I, I oftentimes quote an African proverb that says, it is the man who wears the shoe who knows where it pinches. In other words, uh, you, when you develop something that is bespoke built for your local environment, then you, it's, it's easy to tweak it for your own specific needs. So for example, now in Nigeria, there are certain peculiarities that are unique to Nigeria and there's some that are unique to Africans. But if we were to go to another country like Ghana or Benin Republic or some other country like that, they would have their own unique needs as well. So there's nothing like a one size fits all. But if you are um, coming up with a solution that uh, can easily be adapted as OCR is trying to portray, easy to be adapted and tweaked and tinkered with to suit a particular environment, then it's uh, it's win-win for everyone. It's look, there's more than enough uh, scope for everyone. Uh, it shouldn't be a scene as one person or one entity or one company or one group of companies that will now corner the market. It's not about this. It's, the main thing is to make sure that everybody all over the planet, especially in Africa and Latin America, Southeast Asia, are able to play in the same space that developed countries like uh, you, you find in the West are also able to play. Perfect. Well, Tunji, I'm going to leave it there from the questions, if that's okay, that's um, in the interest of time. Um, sure. So, but thank you so much for answering that. And I know that when we get to the questions later, um, I'll be asking you lots of those as well. So. Uh, thank pleasure. you very much for that. Um, My pleasure. So, thank ladies and gentlemen, we've heard from the OSIA uh, work group um, and um, through through Deborah as, as the chair. We've heard from two leading uh, governments. Uh, but there is one community, of course, that we haven't heard from, and that is the suppliers. Uh, and uh, I've had really great fun over the last week um, interviewing about five different suppliers have um, all embraced and worked together to create uh, the uh, OSIA initiative. And each of the players that you're about to hear from um, all come from different parts of the identity ecosystem. Some of them were large, the la really large, uh, some of them were mid-sized, and some are, are even starting up. Uh, and it, you know, it really showed me how diverse that uh, OSIA community is and um, really how committed to the cause uh, they actually are. So sadly, I couldn't bring them all here today. Um, uh, so we thought the best thing to do would be for me to interview them and then to pull together a compilation of the best bits. Uh, and I, I'm gonna share that with you uh, now. So um, just bear with me while I bring this video up. Um, so I'm gonna play the video now. Well, the well, scope, the scope of, of, uh, of identity management uh, systems system 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 has evolved and grown in the, in the past few Mark, years. you need to put yourself on mute, otherwise we have an echo. Online services, for example. And today, companies have got to work together in order to be capable to provide an end-to-end -end system to a customer. Um, so to collaborate properly, you must be able to interconnect various components easily. That's one. And two, not all components of an identity management system have got the same uh, life cycle. But as a customer, you ought to be able to change one component effortlessly uh, without having to revamp your full uh, system. And OSIA is the only way to do this. I, I was part of the, of the funding of OSIA in, an, in a different company. And, and so the reason why we have moved in that direction because we have perceived the market was willing to open the system for two reasons. One, the first reason was about the vendor lock-in issue that got some customers and they wanted to be a bit more independent of their suppliers. 
and be able to change part of the system when they want uh, to evolve it, not as a wall, but as, uh, by pieces. So that was the first reason. The second reason has been um, because of the, the growing of foundational IT system, there is this need to build an ecosystem. And so now the, the identity system cannot be anymore a silo. It has to be interconnected uh, with different components from the state, also from the private sector, and finally also with the other countries. OCR is the opportunity for a customer to amend or add a part of a system and to develop his system. He doesn't have to replace everything because OCR allows to be flexible and buy from different vendors. So it avoids vendor lock-in for the customer. That's where we think it's important to be part. Well, trying to beat your competitors by preventing them uh, from entering the market cannot be a, a winning strategy. And at Thales, we firmly believe that you should uh, level out the, the playing field, remove uh, such barriers to entry as the so-called uh, vendor lock-in, and uh, allow everyone to, to have a fair chance. At the end of the day, um, you must create a virtuous circle, an upward spiral, and differentiate from the rest based on the uh, innovation that you bring to the table as well as on the quality of your products and services. Then it is really up to the customer to decide who is the best to meet their requirements. We hope that our solutions via the OSEA interface can hook in to other solutions that are already in place and that are maybe sold by bigger vendors. But we might have special solutions that a customer wants and this module via the OSEA interface could hook into existing systems. OSEA was offering to players like us, medium-sized players, uh, to be more directly participating uh, to the ecosystem of identity. Before that, we were more playing a role of subcontractors of the system integrators. Uh, with, uh, with uh, an interoperability standard like OSEA, we are capable now to answer and to serve directly the customer uh, and bring our expertise and our services, our solution on top of, of our hardware, so which is a benefit for the customer also, we, we think, as we are experts of, of this registration. I like the fact we are little uh, and we have OSEA that just um, like to be totally transparent, it will uh, like push us up, you know, to to be like, ah, okay, maybe we are a small company, but uh, we are dealing with others that can just support us on many different ways. I think that uh, there are many of them. Uh, when we are delivering the projects, uh, very often one of the most complicated part uh, of the delivery uh, is to understand what was the legacy system. Very often it's uh, 10 years old and we try to understand uh, uh, how to approach uh, to the legacy data and how to connect to other systems which are the part of the, the solution at customer's uh, ecosystem. And uh, we spend a lot of time just uh, with the integration and adoption, custom development, etc. And I believe that thanks to this new approach, uh, we can shorten this period and reduce the cost significantly. And also uh, for the governments and uh, public players, uh, it will open them or make easier the tenders and uh, the change, uh, the provider, which can at the end of the day uh, increase the competition and uh, reduce the cost. There is uh, one other thing which I believe is also a very important factor and is that you can uh, tender different part of the solution separately. So you don't have to, you, you don't have to tender the, the big solution like all in one solution, but you can do it uh, uh, step by step. So you can, uh, you can tender ABS card management system or population registry or enrollment separately and uh, uh, replace them. Uh, partially if you are not satisfied with the current provider and you are not locked in uh, and it's not uh, that costly to to change your technology that you have and also lifespan 
of ABs can be different than lifespan of the enrollment, where we can see that uh, the world is going mobile, is going towards uh, remote document issuance, and ABs solution is more or less the same like it used to be uh, five uh, years ago. OSEA allows faster decisions, faster integration, the interface is standardized, and each vendor that is compliant with OSEA, it's plug and play. You just hook into the other system, into the enrollment system, into the issuing system, which means it improves the speed of implementation for universal identity management and universal reg registration of people. The ultimate target of the United Nations, of the World Bank. And, but there is an aspect which is interesting that, that we, uh, we would like to, um, to dig in, is, a, is a interoperability in between countries. In the world of tomorrow, there will be more and more people traveling, more and more displaced people, and providing a solution that is able to, enter, to be interoperable in between countries will help a lot in identifying the people and integrate them in, uh, in the foreign countries. I don't know yet about, and uh, I believe uh, this can be easily reused also by uh, in, in enterprise, uh, in banking or, or, or telcos. The OSIA API applies to an identity system. So we have designed it to be uh, used for a civil system, civil system. But obviously the registration of person, the biometric duplication, the authentication of, of person could apply to other areas. And by the way, OSEA is not only a governmental uh, API, it's an API which is opening uh, the civil identity to the private sector, notably. At Alice, we see OSEA becoming a very soon a de facto standard and certainly a mandatory requirement in all identity management system tenders. Uh, it does not cost anything to a government to ask for the components of its identity management system to be OSEA compliant. Yet the same governments will reap considerable benefits of this compliancy when uh, the time will come to uh, upgrade, uh, replace or remove any component of their system. I would like to invite uh, other companies uh, which are uh, like, uh, let's say, medium sized like Innovatrix, uh, not too afraid and join uh, the initiative and be the part of the, of the solution and be part of the, the family. For now, it is gravity, you know, uh, being a, like a decentralized identity representant on the OSIA uh, work group. But uh, hopefully we have also some more so we can uh, like have different point of view. Well, if you have not done so, you should uh, get involved and uh, have your say and uh, sooner rather than later. And obviously, uh, yeah. Brilliant. So um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I, I certainly enjoyed interviewing the suppliers and they you know, really demonstrated uh, lots of different points of view there. Um, and, you know, but there's a common, uh, there's a common belief in, in the future of OSIA and you know, the benefits that are out there and as somebody said on there, you know, it costs governments nothing to, to specify this and I you know, personally can only see advantages. Uh, but I, I'm going to ask uh, Deborah to, to join me back up here on the stage. Um, you know, thanks so much to our government participants and the suppliers. Um, uh, but Deborah, we need to just spend a few minutes discussing the future, uh, the roadmap, if you like. Uh, so what I'm going to say is, Deborah, big picture, can you give me an outline uh, on the future and tell me a little bit about where it's heading. Sure. Um, so first of all, uh, what we would like is to work towards an international uh, recognition of the of the OSIA specification. So for OSIA to become uh, a recognized international standard. Uh, the second point we're working on actually as we speak is uh, capacity building. So we need to build a capacity building program to socialize the interfaces in the approach. Uh, we're also working towards a certification scheme that was a request from governments um, and um, something that is more on a longer term and that we are considering is to uh, build a trusted, uh, a trusted um, uh, structure. So uh, actually um, 
uh, we, we are looking at the current structure of OSIA and see how we could uh, we could build uh, we could change this and uh, and making it an autonomous um, organization uh, independent that um, that could actually uh, continue uh, evolving the the standard and uh, and like I said uh, working on these capacity building programs. Perfect. It's, and it's, uh, carry on. Sorry. No, sorry. So, and last but not least, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, it's about security and privacy. So we are working with academia, I, I mentioned it earlier, uh, to make sure that uh, that we uh, comply with, uh, with the best practices on, on this aspect. So Deborah, um, I can see in the chat already, you've got some people saying, how do I get involved? What's, um, you know, how do we sign up? Um, <laughs> which is great news, you know. Um, so the question I've got is, uh, is is on the area of money, um, which of course is really important uh, to everybody. And and I I can imagine, you know, and I might be wrong, but I can imagine that being OSIA compliant, keeping up with sort of a certification, paying membership fees, you know, this could all get very expensive. And uh, you know, as money is always very close to to people and companies uh, and countries' hearts, uh, tell me a bit about money, Deborah. What's the situation? What do you do with all the money? <laughs> so, so uh, to be part of OSIA, first of all, if you are a consultant or if you are a government, it's free. Um, then uh, if you are a, a private sector, then it's a flat fee of uh, 2,500 euros per year. So it's really minimal and uh, we kept it that way to make sure that uh, we just cover for cost. So literally that, that's, that's what we, uh, we aim to do. So we want to welcome uh, from startup, you've seen it, uh, from startup to SMEs to be corporate and make sure that uh, we continue with the specifications and uh, we cover costs of uh, our cost that is really structural cost, like, uh, you know, marketing, uh, like like doing the brochure, uh, keeping up the, with the website. Uh, when we organize our meetings, then then you know rent a space uh, and uh, and these sort of things. So this is where the the money is going. And of course, developing, for example, the test plan. We have an external company that is uh, is doing this for us. Uh, but the idea, as I said, it, it's really uh, welcome everyone, keeping the fee low enough so that we there's, there are no barriers to entry, and uh, and only covering cost. Okay, that sounds that sounds fair to me. Um, I'm going to ask you. Well, I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball. Um, so actually, I'm going to ask you to look into two crystal balls. Um, so the first crystal ball has been supplied to you by your fairy godmother, who's lovely, um, and the second crystal ball is uh, supplied to you by the wicked witch, um, who isn't really very nice. So looking in these crystal balls and thinking, asking about where we're going to be in five years time, what do you actually see? So let me put it another way. In, in, if everything goes perfectly in the next five years, where might we be? And what, what are the threats that could prevent that vision from coming true? Maybe we start from the bed and then we go for, for I don't remember how it's called the, the, the bed sphere, but the, the, bed, the, the worst case scenario in, in five years time it would be uh, essentially um, to have a dominant player in the market. So to have somebody who is uh, dictating uh, the, the way the, the market the, the market is uh, the next trends and the way uh, to build uh, interoperability, which in this case will be compatibility to their solutions rather than really interoperability as a consensus driven approach. Uh, so that's exactly the opposite of OSIA. So the worst case scenario is if we fail to, to keep up with this momentum to see OSIA uh, implemented and actually seeing uh, one just, just one vision from one particular implementation that is dictating to all the rest how they could work uh, together by just being compatible based on what they claim to be, uh, based on the specifications that they, uh, th that they provide. So essentially the opposite of what we're trying to build. That's really the worst case scenario, but if I'm very negative, and if we look at the bright side of things, so in the best case scenario, uh, it's really seeing OSIA, it's, it's somehow making ourselves obsolete if you want. So it's really seeing OSIA as a recognized standard, seeing it everywhere implemented, um, 
not, not even you know having this this webinar like a surprise anymore so people just uh, it, it's a de facto standard it's recognized everyone is complying with this modularization and the, the market is it's uh, it's open to to all sort of innovation and uh, and seeing the community growing so Ozia, I, I had actually a question from from somebody in the chat which is a good question Ozia is not just Africa so I, I want to take this opportunity to say that uh, interoperability is a problem that goes beyond geography it's not linked to, to a particular geography it just happened that Ozia was born in Africa because African governments had a lot of projects from greenfield countries where, where they were setting up the whole infrastructure and so of course they were asking themselves the right questions like I don't want to be vendor locked I want to make sure that I have something interoperable and that I can um, they can evolve easily over time, uh, and, and so this is why there was a, uh, there was a, um, uh, an attention to, to interoperability and a need for interoperability there. But it is actually, if you look at the OSEA modules and if you look at the other geographies, it's easily uh, replicable. So actually, I invite any government that is interested in uh, in interoperability and in open standard to to join and contribute. Perfect. Deborah, I think that's articulated it all brilliantly. So what I'm going to do now is, I think, uh, I think we'll actually look at the questions uh, next. Um, and could I ask our, our um, gentleman, could I ask you to, to turn on your, your cameras now as well? Um, um, Tunjin and Musa. Uh, because, uh, well, thank you so much. I mean, there's been so many questions um, and Actually, you've all been really, really good at starting to answer these questions, but I think it is worth articulating some of the answers again, just in case people haven't had the chance to um, to look at these. Uh, I mean, by far the biggest uh, upvote was given to the question of the EU Digital Identity Wallet Initiative, which, of course, everyone's very excited about here in, in, in Europe, um, and asking whether OSIA is also involved. So, Deborah, just, just say something quickly about that. Yeah, so very quickly, um, a bit what I what I answered. Actually, we uh, we answered to the EU consultation uh, back last year, I think, and we had the confirmation that our approach was factoring. And uh, actually, we, we welcome the the approach of the the EU, the new regulation. So everything has to be uh, defined because we are at the beginning of the process. But uh, definitely, we are working on it. That would be pretty much a game changer here in Europe, I think. If that, if that yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to get straight on to this, this question, um, the third question, uh, which is why OSIA not MOSIP? And I think there's just such a, a, a misunderstanding here that um, it's important to, um, Tunji's had a, a go at answering that, uh, you've had a go at answering it, but let's just put this question to bed. All right. So, uh, okay. So, jump in, but I mean, Deborah probably, the most. Yes, um, so um, MOSIP is welcome, like any other uh, vendor, any other e particular implementation of a, of, a, of a product or a solution. So MOSIP is competing with vendors, as all vendors are competing with each other. So in OSIA, we are not looking at any particular uh, technology. Uh, so for us, the various components are black boxes. What is important is to build uh, the interoperability layer, so something that goes on, on top of the various modules or the various, the various technology and the vendors to make sure that we all have the same understanding of the modularization and we are compatible with this set of open standard interfaces so if tomorrow you want to even mix an approach, you want to have some open source components, some that are proprietary, you can do so. If you want to have everything proprietary or everything open source, you can do so. The important thing, I mean, for yourself or for, for, uh, for, the, for the one purchasing the solutions is to make sure that they are free uh, to easily change and swap the various components or even grow the solution over time without having issues of compatibility or having to pay for uh, for uh, having to pay for, for uh, effort on uh, on integration when it's not needed. So, 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 so my question is, um, obviously, for that to happen, and you know, there are people who who are very interested in open source solutions. For that to happen, um, MOSIP would have to um, adhere to uh, the OSIA APIs in order for them to be able to mix and match, as you say. Um, yeah. solution for the future and, and I yeah. guess those types of conversations are ongoing yes 
So it's part of the spirit of, uh, of building a community around an open standard. So it's the idea that uh, voluntarily all the various vendors uh, adhere to this. And, and I don't know why we, we are talking about uh, Mozib like it was the only open source out there. There are actually other solutions that are open source uh, and for, for other components, like I'm thinking open CRVS for civil registry. So that would be valid also for that. So it's like you're asking me for, for a specific, can, can Thales or can Idemio, can any other vendor be part of the initiative? Well, yes. That's that would be yes the same answer as i give to to anybody and yes they would need to comply to to this uh, to this set of interfaces yeah perfect okay um so i musa perhaps i could ask you a question here um it's actually a question about nigeria uh but i'm going to um, switch it around a little bit is um you know i suppose the question is uh, you know if if you've got like a a big player like Idemia or Talus or something like that supplying your system at the moment. Um, you can see the question here. But thank you for your answer. But why, why not? Why is Idemia and Nigeria? What's the difference if other companies don't actually get involved? Like, what happens if Idemia take over the whole the whole thing? You know, are you actually? Is it likely that other companies are actually going to have their modules switched in and switched out? Um, I don't know if that's a really difficult question. <laughs> and perhaps it was, should be answered by Tunji, I don't know. But uh, have you got any thoughts, any of you? So Musa can go first. It's difficult for me to, uh, to answer directly to that question. Uh, it's not a problem. For DSC, it's not a problem for one uh, major actor like uh, Idemia or another to, to get the market to develop different model. But the concern is uh, the way we can uh, we can guarantee uh, the other players, for example, Congolese players, can come in uh, and compete. After starting, for example, with the uh, the solutions provided by this, uh, by, by for example, Idemia, is it, it how we can guarantee, for example, Congolese companies or Nigerian companies, why not, can come in uh, after starting uh, with a, a contract, for example, with Idemia, if there is some uh, needs. To change a particular module to another one. I guess it's this modularization of the whole process that makes the difference. Whereas it, in the past, maybe it was one giant system. By having it modularized, it doesn't matter if one supplier supplies the whole lot in the beginning. The option is then, if you decide, oh, this bit needs changing, that can happen and that could be provided by anybody um, that supplies an appropriate piece of technology as long as they adhere to the standards. Is that, is that resonating with you, Tanji? You know, in, in, okay. in, in my country, for example. So, okay. Sorry. Yes, in my countries, the different models um, are managed by different ministries. You know, you have you have a, a model which, which which is managed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Another model is uh, managed by the Ministry of Interior, and so on. Uh, and these projects may not be uh, conducted uh, one after another. Um, sometimes they, these models can be developed uh, uh, in the same times. And if a, a, a given minister decides to, to change, to, uh, to, to, to innovate uh, with the specifications, uh, in that case, it can, it can be important to stop what is being developed by a, a given uh, actors and give the chance to others com to, to, to compete and select uh, a convenient uh, solution. Cool. Tundi, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, indeed. So, aside from Nigeria, I also have the privilege of serving as a uh, um, identity management consultant to two other <coughs> excuse me, African countries. And the story is actually pretty much the same 
uh, in many parts of the continent. Over the years, uh, the, uh, this, these governments have had many issues with proprietary solutions that um, at the end of the day, yes, the first year, second year, it works perfectly well, flawlessly. Maybe it was one, one big company that came in and uh, offered a solution, maybe a PPP solution and all whatnot. And then when it came to time of tweaking it, uh, uh, requesting for updates and so on and so forth, oh, you have to pay support and maintenance. We are owing for this, you're owing for that. And when the government can't pay, then the system shuts down. And it's then difficult for a third party to come in and then tweak this or tweak that. The, organize, the company will say, oh, it's a proprietary solution. We spend so much money or millions of euros on, on research and development and so on and so forth. It's the same story across the continent. But what is now happening across the continent is that just as my, uh, my friend uh, uh, Musa had just pointed out, is that uh, younger, smaller players in these countries that have developed skills on their own, they're spent on their own research and development, and have come up with um, state-of-the-art solutions, and are trying to get into, um, uh, to participate in some of these, uh, these projects in their own countries. They had found in the past that it was squeezed out by the much larger players who would come in. And at the end of the day, uh, what they also found was that they, when they bring their invoices, they want, their, they want uh, the government's money in their own currencies, not the local currency. So, you know, they, it has been putting a, a lot of pressure on um, foreign exchange reserves and, and the like. So what we are finding very exciting nowadays is that, just as Deborah pointed out, even if you come with a black box solution of your own and of the, the other players as well, so long as those uh, interfaces can interconnect and talk to each other. And if two, three, four, five years down the line, a government decides on in its own wisdom that it no longer wishes to have that component, if they cannot take it out and use maybe a more efficient, more up-to-date, uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe more cost-effective uh, 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 component to replace that module, and then everything goes on on smoothly. Um, it's it's uh, the, the world has changed. The world is adapt is adapting is adopting so many new standards, and there are a lot of disruptive technologies that are coming in. But this is now not now the time to play around with um, fanciful ideas because. There are a lot of security challenges, as you well know, around the continent. So you need uh, players that have that background and experience, but at the same time have the, the technical know-how to be able to uh, implement various components to be able to play in the same uh, space. We provide a level playing field for as many uh, uh, players as possible, rather than just just uh, the few well-known uh, well uh, uh, actors. OCI was not set up for one or more particular uh, 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 players, but taught everybody to come together and say, look, enough of the proprietary uh, endpoints. Let's come together and see how we can come up with solutions that um, will work for everyone. Deborah also pointed out something else which I would like to emphasize before I hand over, and that is initially, um, uh, some other actors who were wary about the OCI initiative, initiative felt that maybe these, uh, these uh, actors that are part of, of, of uh, the initial found, uh, foundation members of OCI were just trying to broaden uh, the, the, their own uh, landscape so that those big players alone would be able to come up and say, oh, we have solutions that are OCI compliant, kick out everybody else. But that is not exactly what is happening here, because you'll find out the makeup of, of OCR is both small, medium, and large players. So it, you know, the landscape is really changing, and it's a, a very exciting time indeed. I mean, I don't think there's much to add to that. I've been through the questions whilst you've been talking. I think they've all been answered um, uh, you know, by, by our speakers. Um, and you know, I encourage them to continue to have a look at these questions um, after the end of the webinar. You can continue to add if you if you wish. Um, but I don't think that uh, we we could end on a better um, um, speech than you've just given there, uh, Tanji. And uh, 
But well, we can actually, we can actually, because uh, we actually have a another two minute video, and I actually will end the webinar uh, with that two minute video. Um, but um, you know, it it would it would fall to me then to say thank you so much to uh, to to Musa at DRC, Deborah at Ossia, um, and Tunji uh, in well, representing NIMSI and Common Identity. Uh, I think it's been a really fascinating um, hour and 50 minutes. It's been a little bit longer than we'd anticipated, but that's because there's so much good information out there. Um, please do stay around to watch this two and a half um, minute video. It's showing another use case um, um, of the OSIA implementation. And um, my thanks to all of you, obviously, as viewers. Um, it's, been, it's been great. Thank you for all the questions. Um, until next time, stay safe and uh, thank you very much for attending. And uh, thank please, you for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. These are These all the are various all building various blocks building available blocks. on the market necessary to build your ID management system. If these building blocks include OSIR interfaces, they can be easily connected even if from different vendors to form the identity management solution that fits your needs. Let's take an example. A government establishes a unique identity for the citizens and offers identity verification services to third parties like banks and mobile network operators. To issue an ID card, citizens must first get enrolled. Let's follow the journey of five citizens living in different locations. Paul Black is enrolled by Thales. John Green by Copernic. Jack Red by Laxton. Danielle Blue by OSD. And Sam White is enrolled by FAMOCO. Thanks to OSIA interfaces, all these different enrollment systems can transfer without integration effort the collected data to the other building blocks for processing and storage. The Thales Identity Management System stores the demographic and biometrics data and if no problems are detected, further to a biometric and biographic search, it creates a unique ID number for Paul, John, Jack, Danielle and Sam. The government is now able to offer identity verification services to third parties like banks and mobile network operators in accordance with data privacy laws in place in the country. Interoperability benefits innovation and competition and can only be achieved with the contribution and engagement of the whole community. Join the OSIA initiative. Help us bring interoperability to life.